Okay, I think we can start the second talk in this afternoon session or the second lecture, which is the first lecture of um, Volodya Temyakov. So he's uh, one of the organizers of this workshop and uh, is about to give two lectures. One lecture is today about sampling recovery, um, recovery in LP norms, and the second one will be, uh, no, I don't want it. <clears throat> to tomorrow. Test. It will be tomorrow. It will be tomorrow at um, 5.30 yeah. on recovery and discretization. So, yeah, Blodia, stage is yours. We are Thank you, Tino. Yeah, so let me begin. And uh, my talk, this first lecture, uh, will be, in a sense, uh, very introductory. So uh, it's more oriented uh, to like uh, graduate students and uh, young researchers. Uh, but also there will be some connections to very recent results uh, and uh, the new results uh, will be presented tomorrow in the second lecture. Uh, and uh, the first thing what I want to stress in today's lecture uh, is this one that recovery in the LP norms. So everybody knows that the subject of interpolation, for instance, it is a classical uh, subject which goes back to 19th century. Uh, but in all those cases, what we do, uh, we interpolate and measure the error usually in the uniform norm. Uh, and the fact that we can do something with that same operators of interpolation in LP, uh, that basically was discovered sometimes in uh, like 80s of last century. So I will begin with that and we'll go then slowly to uh, new results in that direction. So, uh, let's begin with, uh, with the definition. Everything will be illustrated, at least in the first uh, slides, on the trigonometric polynomials, because it is convenient to work with these uh, classical objects. So what is a trigonometric polynomial? Uh, this everybody knows then, but just it's written like in cosine and sine, so in exponential form. So this one uh, is an, uh, a trigonometric polynomial of order n, or sometimes we say this of degree n. Uh, so, and this is the notation for this class of object, the trigonometric polynomials. So now when we uh, ask the question about interpolation using these polynomials, uh, it is very natural uh, to consider the Dirichlet kernels. Uh, why so? That if you define the Dirichlet kernel in that form, it turns out just because of this formula, it's very simple summation formula, and this is just a proof here, so if you look at uh, uh, the numerator of this formula, uh, you can see immediately what are zeros of this function and what are the points where this function takes value uh, non-zero. So like for instance, at zero point, it is equal to two n plus one. So if you uh, look at this and denote these points, two pi j divided by two n plus one, uh, so and, uh, j from 0 to 2n, but as we said at uh, 0, this is the 0 point, the function takes value 2n plus 1, but at all other points, uh, this function takes value 0. So in that sense, uh, dirichlet kernel is very convenient for interpolation. So for instance, if you write, if you use the operator like this, so this operator is defined on all continuous functions. So if you define this as follows, that uh, we take the function value at points x, j, uh, and multiply by the Dirichlet kernel shifted by this point. So that means if x is equal to x, j, this one is 2n plus 1, and cancel this one, it is 1. And at all other points, it is 0. So clearly, we have uh, uh, identity like this. At, at all these points, at all these points, 2n plus 1 points, we have this relation. So this is very good property. Uh, but uh, it turns out that uh, in, the, in, in the future, in the further steps, uh, we will uh, relax this property a lot. So we will not require interpolation because in, multi in, in multivariate case, uh, it, it is a very uh, strong uh, requirement. So, uh, but now when we have an operator like this, uh, and uh, in approximations here, it is a classical one. So we need to uh, measure how good this operator is. That means to measure error of this approximation or of this interpolation, like in this case. Uh, so then here are some properties which are very natural and very easy to prove. 
like one of the properties is very important one that if you take a trigonometric polynomial now uh, exactly of order n and the corresponding Dirichlet kernel is also uh, corresponds to polynomials of order n then we have this property uh, that this operator is an identical identity operator on this set on this subset so this is one fact which we can use and another fact that again from that uh, formula explicit formula which was written here uh, we can uh, find the measurement for this kernel and the measure measurement is like this this is trivial and this is from the sign in the denominator so we get that bound and it is comparatively easy to get the following uh, relation so if you take any continuous function apply this interpolation operator and then you measure the arrow in l infinity then you get the following bound so here is e and f i will explain what is that so e and f this is the best approximation of f in the lp norm here in l infinity norm by trigonometric polynomials of order n so that means this relation uh, this is uh, relation which was proved by Lebeck and now the relations like this are called Lebeck type inequalities so what is the meaning of this uh, inequality so on in the right hand side uh, we have the best what we can achieve using this tool using the trigonometric polynomials of uh, order n and we allow any way to build an approximate the only restriction is that this approximate should come from this subspace so it could be linear, nonlinear, doesn't matter. But here on the left hand side, we have a very specific operator, this uh, interpolation operator. So that means when we compare this again in the style what Erich was talking about, we are comparing one thing which has uh, very practical and uh, has very simple form. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, in the right, we have something which is the best and could be uh, more complicated to build but this formula shows that this operator interpolation operator provides pretty good approximation so we can lose at most uh, a factor log n but even this log n is sometimes a problem and we would probably like to get rid of it and there, there are ways and this again classical thing so along with the Dirichlet kernel uh, we can see the uh, another one the, the level of percent kernel uh, and again, it is a classical object. There are different ways to define this uh, kernel. So to write them, it could be written in terms of Fourier coefficients. So, but this is convenient way. So what we do, it is an arithmetical mean of Dirichlet kernels. Uh, but we begin with k equals n and up to this. So from this formula, it is clear that the, the level Lepersen kernel, uh, it is a, a trigonometric polynomial of degree 2n minus 1. So this index here to n, it does not represent exactly the order, but more represents that just related to n. This is standard notation, so clearly I follow uh, the standard notation. And there is a closed formula for this uh, kernel, which again allows us to get the measure round for this kernel. So now some properties of this kernel. Uh, again, clearly that it is an even trigonometric polynomial. This is the same like the Dirichlet kernel. Uh, and as I already said, it is a polynomial of order 2n minus 1. And here, here is the measurement. And in a certain sense, this measurement is better than for, for, for the Dirichlet kernel. It is more localized. So the up, this, this upper bound is trivial, uh, like is the Dirichlet kernel, but this one is better. Now it's not 1 over x, which as a result of summation or integration gave us log. It is like this, 1 over n multiplied by x squared. So when we integrate from one over n to say pi, uh, this gives us a constant. So this is very important. And this uh, means that the L1 norm of the, the level Lipus kernel is of uh, order one. So it is a constant uh, opposite to the Dirichlet kernel. The L1 norm of the Dirichlet kernel is of order log n. And this is why we had that log n and the uh, Lebesgue type inequality. So with this, the level of Pousset kernel, we can consider another operator. And now this operator is built in, the, in exactly the same way, I would say in the spirit, uh, like we did with the interpolation operator. Uh, so now we uh, identify uh, this set of points. Uh, so now these are different points. This uh, 
j multiplied by pi and divided by 2n uh, and build the recovery operator in this one. So what we do, we write the sum that again, we use only function evaluation at these given points. And then uh, shifts of the, uh, the level of percent kernel. And this is normalization term one over four n, the number of some months here. So now we cannot guarantee uh, that this recovery operator uh, will interpolate. That means if you evaluate this function, this polynomial at this point, we cannot guarantee that it is the function value. And actually in this particular case, it most likely will not be the case. Uh, but what we guarantee, and this is a good point, that we only use the function values. So again, and what uh, in the terminology of uh, information-based uh, complexity uh, community, uh, so this operator uses only the standard information. So the function value, and this is what we call a re recovery operator. Let me point out right away the following uh, important thing, uh, that with the Dirichlet kernel, uh, with the Dirichlet kernel, we hit and, and we worked with the Dirichlet kernel with polynomials uh, of degree uh, n, that means the uh, dimension of that subspace is 2n plus 1. And we used exactly 2n plus 1 points. So we will play in with this operator and good properties of this, this operator now are established again for polynomials of, uh, of, order of, of order n, that means the subspace of dimension 2n plus 1, but if you look at this, we use more points. We use two n points. Not exactly two n plus one was as a dimension, but just constant uh, multiplied by that dimension. So, and this is this is important. Uh, let me uh, list the properties which are similar to the Dirichlet kernel. Uh, this property, again, uh, is easy to uh, to prove. It's a little technical, but it's very easy to to prove that again this operator when we apply this operator to trigonometric polynomials of uh, order n, we get exactly that same polynomial. So it is an identity operator when it is restricted on those polynomials. Uh, but because of that measure run formula, which I already commended, instead of this extra log here, we get formula like this. So for any f, for any continuous f, so now we do not need even to restrict ourselves to any classes. Uh, just for any f, you have this, uh, this formula. So in this sense, <coughs> clearly, one can say that here, uh, we have a subspace of dimension 2n plus 1. That means we basically have 2n plus 1 parameters. Here, we evaluate our functions at, two, at 4 multiplied by n points. So this is a little different. And, but anyway, in the spirit, uh, we can see from here that this operator, the recovery operator, is in a sense optimal. Uh, in the sense of order, it is, in, it is an optimal one. So, but this is very introductory, and this is what, that was well known, like uh, maybe in the 19, 1920s, uh, for sure. But now the next question is, so uh, if uh, this operators, both of them are so good in L infinity, uh, uh, what should we do and what can be done uh, how this operator can be analyzed in LP. So we can assume, our, uh, just for simplicity, we can always assume that our functions which we are working with uh, are continuous functions. But what we would like to hear, if you would like to replace infinity here and infinity here by say LP. Okay, let function be continuous, but could we do this? And this is basically, this is the question, and this is what I will discuss. And it turns out that uh, that question is non-trivial uh, because, uh, see, this operator Rn, uh, it is clearly defined as an operator on the space of continuous function, and it, it, is, it is a bounded operator uh, on that. But uh, if you look at LP, uh, this is not the case if P is not infinite. So something should be done. Uh, so, and uh, now let's, uh, let's do something uh, which is very classical, very standard in approximation theory. Uh, let's have a look on the behavior of this uh, recovery operators on some classes of functions. But this will be our class of function. So in contemporary notations, it would be rather denoted by A uh, because it is a standard approximation class. So we have a sequence of numbers uh, which decay to zero. Uh, and we consider the class of functions which are continuous, uh, but 
in addition to that, they, we have a bound uh, on the decay of the approximation, uh, but in LP naught. And P is a parameter between one and infinity, infinity naught and blue. Because with infinity, this basically solves the problem. So we uh, consider this. And it turns out that in that case, uh, we can prove some results. And uh, let me dwell a little bit on this uh, theorem. This is old theorem. Uh, and it's interesting in the sense that it gives, uh, in a sense, uh, some unexpected uh, result. And also, this result is shocked. So what is that? First, some conditions on the sequence uh, of uh, this approximation. So we need some, basically, it means that this behaves more or less like uh, decay, like a power or power multiplied by a log and so on. So these are properties. One thing that uh, the detail uh, is rather small. So we have this, but uh, pay attention to this two to the S, so this dyadic, dyadic terms. Uh, and this monotonically, uh, mon it monotonically decays. So this is uh, the, the restriction. And also uh, that uh, they do not uh, decay too fast. So this is basically a condition that they do not decay. Like polynomial is fine here. So then you have the following property. It turns out that that recovery operator applied to the whole class. And you take a supremum. So this is like the worst, the worst case setting. Uh, for approximation for error in LP. And it turns out that it can be written uh, in a sense of explicitly in a sense of order like this, uh, this series. Uh, uh, let's uh, take a closer look to this series to understand better what is that. So we can see here uh, that uh, pay attention to this uh, index because this is n multiplied by two to the n. So we take this like dyadically n, then 2n, 4n, and so on, and multiplied by these extra terms. But the first one, when nu is equal to 0, this is 1. So this is like it was in the previous results. This is like, that was like this. But here, we have the tail of this series. And the tail of this series is like this, 2 to the nu over p, and multiplied by this. So for instance, if just analyzing this, if epsilon n is exactly of order n to the minus r and r is strictly greater than one over p, then you will see that all these things can be bounded above by n to the minus r. So if this is the case, then we are fine. But if this decays like n to the minus r and r is exactly one over p, and maybe some extra logs there, then it will give you an extra log. So, but this is uh, equivalency. So this means uh, that we are not losing anything. This is exactly what we pay for uh, replacing arbitrary uh, approximation method by this recovery operator. So this kind of effect was discovered that long ago, but now let's proceed further. Uh, and, and this is just historical comment. So in, that, in this paper, it was written for P between one and two, but more or less the same. Uh, technique uh, applies for all p. So now this just just the remarks, but uh, now let's think about the fallen, uh, which I already mentioned. But let's try to put this more uh, seriously mathematically. Uh, so if you take this uh, operator, this recovery operator, uh, we can clearly study this operator as an operator from c to c, and we know that norm is bounded by constant c. Uh, so this is this is easy, but we cannot write this L infinity LP to LP uh, because in that case it will be immediately uh, infinity uh, and does not make uh, much sense. So in order to study this operator, uh, we need to do something in order to uh, study operators. And this is a remark that this, this property basically allows us to do in the combination uh, with uh, the property that Rn restricted to trigonometric polynomials is an identity operator. Uh, but historically, and this shows that now we understand pretty well how to uh, handle this operator in LP. Uh, but uh, in the very beginning, and it's like 40 years ago, uh, it was not that obvious. And the first attempt, and then the successful attempt, uh, was the following. So now, in order to avoid that problems with applying uh, this evaluation, functional evaluation of operator to LP as a space, uh, we consider the uh, the operator like this. 
the composition of operators. We apply first the operator, which smooths up the functions. And this is the integration operator. I will talk about this uh, in more details uh, a little later. Uh, but this combination. So when we apply this operator to the function even in L1, it makes it, it smooth, uh, for sure, continuous. And now we can apply this one. And we can now study the behavior of, uh, of the norms of this operator, operator, the combination. But so what is this operator? If you look at this, so basically it is integration. Because the k to the minus r is sort of corresponds to the integration r times. Uh, and r could be uh, even not natural number, could be even fractional number. It doesn't matter. This is just a definition. But also, uh, it is a definition for the class. Uh, for those who are familiar with uh, univariate Sobolev classes, uh, that will be exactly a definition of the class. So that means the class, uh, the unit ball of the Sobolev space, will be exactly an image uh, on the application of this operator uh, JR to the unit ball in LP. So this will be exactly that unit. So basically, studying this operator is equivalent to the study of uh, the corresponding uh, unit ball in the Sobolev space. So these things, these two things are equivalent. So, and it was established that if R is greater than one over P, and we understand already from that formula that uh, one uh, over P is a kind of threshold. And also that was seen from uh, uh, errors talk, but in very general setting. Uh, but still this one over p in his case p was two so that was one half now this is kind of a critical threshold so if r is big enough that means we can guarantee good properties then uh, the norm of this operator so i is an identity operator so basically this shows how well we can approximate uh, functions from the class which is defined by this operator so basically from the Sobolev class then we have this bound n to the minus r and it is known for the corresponding class, this n to, to the minus r is exactly the best what we can do uh, by using any means by trigonometric approximation. So let's keep going. But it turned out uh, that uh, this combination, rn and uh, jr, is not in a sense the most convenient. So technically it turned out that there is another way uh, which is even more uh, convenient. And that is the following combination. Again, it is a combination, but in this case, we combine uh, the operator of uh, recovering uh, with the uh, operator of taking uh, partial sums uh, with respect to this uh, De Lavo Lippesen kernel. So now we define our operator as a convolution with the corresponding De Lavo Lippesen kernel. So, and actually, this is the De Lavo Lippesen sums uh, of the Fourier series of function f. So this is the definition of this operator. Uh, certainly, uh, the range of this operator is very nice. These are polynomials, uh, trigonometric polynomials of degree s. So certainly, we can apply this operator to those polynomials. And it turns out that we can write uh, the rather convenient and precise uh, upper bound for the norm of this operator. So it turns out that this is like that, s over n. And again, see this. Uh, uh, exponent and this explains why this exponent uh, arises so naturally in this problem this is one over p this one over p uh, it is written even for p equals infinity because we know that when uh, p is infinity both of these operators are bounded so it's not a surprise but for lp this this turns out to be uh, convenient uh, just making a remark uh, because we are studying in parallel this recovery and interpolation but if you use i n then and it is known that uh, when p is strictly between one and infinity, we do not need extra laws. So this is still the same, the same formula. But the constant now allows to depend on p. But for p between one and infinity is different story. We will not uh, talk about this for this one because this serve uh, the, the, the goal. So now just uh, that was a very classical, I would say, introductory approach uh, to this particular operator. Uh, but now when we have some specific particular operators, you know that uh, following in the logic of approximation theory, which uh, started like again from uh, Lebeg and then was continued by Kolmogorov and so on, we want to 
prove or to understand how good is our particular operator. That means you need to formulate an optimization problem. So in there are different settings of that, but in this, uh, in our setting of recovery, this is one of the standard uh, settings. So clearly after the concept of Kolmogorov weeds and later the linear weeds and some other weeds were uh, in, in developed and introduced and developed, uh, then uh, to give a definition like this, it's nothing because it's very natural uh, extension of those concepts, but uh, in, a, in a form and a specific form of recovery. So what is that? Let's look at this because this will be a very important concept, but mostly for the next lecture, not for this lecture, uh, but just let's look at this definition. So we begin with a set of points uh, and we consider all operators, but linear operators in this case, uh, which map the function values, that is the vector of function values evaluated at these points. So these points, f x c one and so on, f x c m. We apply this operator, which maps this into LP omega mu. Mu is a probability measure. And we measure the deviation from f in LP naught. So then you take a supremum. So this will be a characteristic of this specific method, phi, phi c, and the set of points. But now we want to make this optimal. So we are minimizing over all linear mappings and over all sets of points, but uh, with a restriction that there is just m points. So as a result, we have here parameter m. That means that this is the power of uh, the budget of our information, which we can use and the function class. NLP clearly states that everything is formulated in LP. So this is a linear. This is a linear, so in a sense, it's an analog of uh, linear weights, but linear just in that sense, linear there, linear here. Uh, certainly we can uh, modify this and allow this uh, phi C, like it is written here, uh, to be any, uh, any operator, but still which maps uh, vectors from CM, which will be the function values at, on the set of these points, uh, into this space LP omega. Uh, and then we take infimum. Certainly now this infimum is taken over a wider class of uh, operators. Uh, and certainly this quantity will be less equal than this one. So in a sense, this is an analog of uh, Kolmogorov, because these five say are any. Uh, but here we put a restriction that uh, it maps not uh, just arbitrarily to this, but to some uh, linear subspace XM, linear subspace. So still the linearity somehow is there, but again, like in Kolmogorov, this is just a linear subspace, but the operator can be in, can be in. So now let's uh, return back to uh, these uh, classes and see uh, what uh, is known there. Basically, I will reformulate more or less the results which we have already done. Uh, because this is in the preparation to the next step to go to a uh, multivariate case because that is a very interesting problem which is still by the way uh, not solved so this is a standard uh, unit ball of soboli plus and we use this uh, like a notation for this unit ball, unit, unit ball so this is an image of the unit lq ball q stands here uh, uh, and this is the definition and now that was a theorem that it turns out that the univariate case, uh, we can solve both of those problems. This one, that means the recovery and the optimal recovery. This optimal recovery by linear methods. And that was proved uh, that these two, these two uh, provide, I mean, basically of the same order. Clearly this one is uh, uh, less or equal than, than this one, because uh, this is, uh, the one particular method of recovery, and this is a bound for the optimal one. But it turns out that for these classes in the univariate case, these are the same, and this is the order. For those who know uh, the, the behavior of, for instance, Kolmogorov weeds, if you look at this uh, exponent here, you will see uh, that these orders here are of the same order as the best trigonometric approximation, uh, but Kolmogorov widgets, for instance, in some uh, range for Q and P are better, much better than this. So in that sense, this does not provide in some cases uh, the uh, Kolmogorov widgets order, but it provides uh, best, uh, best 
approximation by trigonometric polynomials. So, and these are trigonometric polynomials. So, uh, this is the order. I will not comment on this, but these uh, orders, uh, in a sense, were non trivial in both ways and upper bounds and lower bounds. Upper bounds, I have already explained that it was a problem with uh, the Q, which is strictly, or P, which is strictly less than infinity. Uh, but the lower bounds were also non-trivial and required some, some special technique. But I will not go in those details. But anyway, in the univariate case, this is known, and this is the order. And this is the order. Again, remember that this order coincides with the best uh, approximation by trigonometric polynomials of uh, corresponding degree or corresponding order. Now let's make a step uh, in the direction of multivariate uh, classes. So uh, there are many different ways to define multivariate uh, classes, uh, but there are two, I would say, the most standard. One is uh, anisotropic uh, Sobolev classes, which are called, uh, and another way is the classes with mixed uh, bounded derivative, or difference, but let's talk about derivative. So I will talk only about this uh, mixed smoothness classes. Because those classes, uh, which I just mentioned, Sobolev and isotropic classes, uh, they can basically can be handled using more or less the same technique as the univariate case. And qualitatively, uh, you get the same results there. But classes with bounded mixed derivative are much more complicated. So let's talk about these classes. So this is a formal definition. So what we do now, we do the same thing, but the operator uh, is a product this one is the product of univariate operators. It's written there in the form of the kernel, uh, but this is the product. So this one is the product of this. And this product, actually, this is why we are talking about uh, mixed uh, derivative, because uh, the product this corresponds to the product of this. And this product means that we are integrating first with respect to one variable, then with respect to another variable. So this will be kind of mixed integration. And <clears throat> the, the inverse is mixed differentiation. And like as before, this one, but pay attention to this. Now it is a bold case, and R is also a bold case. Uh, this is the unit ball of multivariate functions uh, with bounded in LQ mixed R derivative. Uh, now, clearly, the question is uh, how to build the recovery operators. And it turned out that uh, the idea which was used and uh, formulated for the first time in the paper by Smolak in 1963 uh, gives a very nice, uh, I mean, which is widely used until now, very nice way uh, to handle this problem with uh, approximation of classes with bounded mixed derivative. So it goes in a way, I would say, similar to what people used before, like Babienka, uh, but technically it's a very, very nice, very nice way. So let me explain this in all, in all detail. So what is the idea of this small yak operator? We use uh, what is natural, we use univariate operators. So now let this R uh, be our univariate operator Rn, and this I stands for the derivative, for, for, for the variable, xi, uh, with respect to which this operator is applied. So we have d variables. So then we will have rn1, rn2, and so on, rn d. And now we take a difference. We take a difference of these operators. So this is a simple step, but this turns out to be very, very convenient. And in order to <clears throat> have a convenient formulas for summation, we write this. This is just an agreement. r with this index is just zero operator. And multivari multivariate case is a product, the corresponding product of these operators. So S is a vector, and this is the product. This is the product. Then uh, the small lag type operator is defined like this. So let look, let's look at this. So this delta S is a product of this. So basically, let's think this in the following, in the following way. So Rn can be associated with trigonometric polynomials of degree n. So that means this difference will be more or less associated with trigonometric polynomials of degree 2 to the s. So that means this delta s is associated with trigonometric polynomials of degree 2 to the sj uh, with respect to the variable xj. So these are parallel pipettes, uh, but s 
gives us the shape of that uh, <clears throat> of that parallel pipe and, and also the size of this parallel pipe. So this operator T and I mean this small x idea can be applied uh, not only to this specific uh, recovery operators, but more or less to any univariate uh, operator. Uh, and it works in some other cases. For instance, if you take as Rn just a partial sum, uh, that it will be very convenient, but it was known before Smolak and uh, Michigan used that kind of operators. Uh, and uh, they turned out to be very good for approximation of functions with bounded mixed derivative. Uh, but <clears throat> again, if you look at this, uh, let's look at this operator. Just uh, uh, one more remark. That remember that this Rn, <clears throat> I'm sorry, it used four multiplied by n uh, function values. That means this one, this one uses two to the Sj function values. Uh, I mean the the variable xj. So and if you take the all of them, then you should multiply to the sj multiplied by two to the s1 multiplied by two to the s2 and so on. So the total number of uh, function values which this operator uses will be two to the norm s1. So basically when you write it like this, we control the total number of function evaluations which you need to do in order to uh, write the value of this uh, operator at some point. So, and it is easy to see from what I just said <clears throat> that the total number of function values is bounded like this. So this sign means that we can write constant here, uh, which may depend on dimension G, uh, but doesn't depend on N uh, like this. So this is two to the K and this is for each uh, uh, layer, layer like this. And this will be two to the N multiplied by N to the D minus one. So this is important <clears throat> characteristic in approximation by these hyperbolic crosses, but uh, uh, we will see this a little later. So now the results. So Smolak himself, uh, <clears throat> using just the infinity technique, uh, which was developed by that time, but there was no technique in, uh, in the case of uh, Q less or P less than infinity. So he proved this bound. So this is in a sense pretty good bound uh, because the main term here two to the minus Rn, uh, and this is known and was known those days uh, that even, even if you look at the uh, uh, Kolmogorov widths of this class, uh, then, uh, in a, in a sense of uh, uh, order in, in N in a polynomial order, then this is the right one. So the question is what are the corresponding uh, logarithmic terms here? <clears throat> Why is that? Because even if R is equal to, I mean, just take one uh, univariate case, uh, you know that this is the right order, but this is multivariate that is more complicated. But anyway, still the question about this extra N is, is, is open. Uh, but let's keep going. So it turns out that this idea, which I just explained to build a small operator like this and to, to build a recovery operator like this uh, works uh, in LP case two. Uh, but in this case, now <clears throat> we need to use this uh, formulas, which I wrote before. I will just return back a little bit, uh, this ones. So if you use these operators, but we can do this, uh, then, and dividing this in the, in the dyadic blocks, so then we can prove this result. So that same extra multiplier, but this again, it, it's, it's a good one, but this one is not known if it is correct or not. Uh, for this one, for LP, uh, uh, and for, for in some cases, these are improved. So I will not talk about this too much, maybe just formulate some, some open problems. Uh, but anyway, so that, that was a step forward with that same technique which was developed by, by Smolak and we got this result. So there were results in this direction. So now open problem, uh, as I already mentioned several times. So this quantity uh, is not known for all this P and for none of this P, we know the right order of this row N. Like P and P are here the same. Even in P equals infinity, what I explained is 
uh, kind of easier for recovery, but uh, for classes with bounded mixed derivative, it is known that this case, P and P equals infinity, uh, is a very difficult case. Like P and P equals one, also very difficult case. So it is an open problem. It is one of the outstanding open problems in this direction. And we are making progress little bit by little bit, but still the problem is open. Uh, now, for the results, just to give you some impression, and by the way, um, there are uh, books on this topic. Uh, one of those is our uh, uh, like survey book, uh, with Jin Zung, uh, Tino Ulrich, and myself as authors. Uh, this is a recent book. Uh, you can find the uh, survey in there. <clears throat> and also my recent book, Mul Multivariate Approximation, where you can find the proofs of these results, of all these results, which I mentioned uh, today. So in this case, it is not. The order of optimal recovery is provided by Smolak operator T. So, and that was kind of a belief, not only because of this result, but this so natural operator T N uh, that it was a belief that uh, what we need to do is just to prove lower bounds uh, in this problem uh, and upper bounds and improve these upper bounds. But anyway, upper bounds kind of uh, are provided by this operator T. Uh, but it turns out that this is not the case. And you will hear this in, in a couple of uh, talks uh, during this school conference. Uh, but let's keep going. But one more remark here. <clears throat> Again, if you compare this order, you can see two parameters. The class is given in LQ, in L2, but we measure the arrow in L infinity. It is known that in this case, uh, but like in, in the univariate case, uh, the right order of this uh, of, of, of the Kolmogorov width is m to the minus r. There is no one half. Uh, but when we try to do this with uh, recovery operators, we pay the price, and this is one half. We cannot do anything better. Clearly, that was seen from the univariate result, which I cited before. But anyway, this is the right order with log two. So this is the right order for this. Uh, some more. Uh, this result. And maybe I will deviate a little bit just to provide you some uh, extra, I would say, information about all these uh, things. So now we can clearly consider, like it is written here, uh, we can consider different Q and P, that means the class is given in one norm and we measure the arrow in another norm. So people did this in the, in the, in the, in the context of uh, widths, Kolmogorov widths, linear widths, and other widths uh, all the time. So it is standard to consider the whole picture, to try to build the whole picture. So we can do this in uh, recovery problem too, but in this case, just specific operator, the small lag type operator. So it is known so that for this one, this is this is, uh, this is the same. But now let me uh, formulate uh, some inequalities which can be used uh, to evaluate to bound uh, the arrow in LP. In this case, P will be strictly less than infinity, but anyway. So what are those inequalities? Those are useful independently of this problem. So this then can be used in, in other problems too, but this is multivariate uh, specifics there. And let me explain that. So we need dyadic blocks. So this is standard uh, notation for the dyadic block. So see uh, the, the, the frequencies uh, in uh, J's uh, variable, they are between two to the S J minus one and two to the S J. And that is for all J. So this is like this parallel pipe. The shape is given by the uh, vector S. And this is the corresponding part of the Fourier series of this function S. So this is a dyadic block. And now we are interested in the following problem. Suppose we know the norms of these dyadic blocks, say LQ norms of the dyadic blocks. What can we say about LP norm of the whole function F? So again, in order to formulate this in a precise form, we introduce in this case, the array of the numbers now this is just non-negative numbers, so, so we don't need to make them monotone in any sense because these are kind of independent for each dyadic block, uh, its own epsilon. 
And now here is uh, here are two classes, two classes which we uh, I will make a remark that it can be formulated in a sort of simpler way, but this is more accurate way. So let's follow this. So this class, class G, for this array, given array and fixed Q. So these are all functions which are in LQ clearly, and with norms of these dyadic blocks bounded or controlled by this epsilon s. So this is the class. So for instance, if you have f, that f belongs to this one with epsilon array is just b in this norm, this norm. And this one is the opposite one, the opposite inequality. So basically, for this one, we will prove the uh, upper bounds and for this one lower bounds and the, the the theorem which i will formulate shows that those upper bounds which you can formulate are optimal so this is the point of considering of this class so let's look at this so what is that so as i said we are interested in this lp norm so first uh, look at this soup so it is a soup and it's it is it is equivalent to this that means it is less or equal than constant multiplied by this so that means if I take any f, now forget about this soup, if I take any f and instead of this epsilon s, I put here these norms, these norms, that it will give me a, an upper bound, right? So this follows from this result. But another thing in this here, it says that you cannot improve that uh, result. For any uh, array epsilon, you cannot improve that result. Any array epsilon, this is like that because these constants do not depend on epsilon. And similarly with infimum. So Russ, if infimum, that means this gives us the lower bound for any f, uh, and you cannot improve that lower bound. So and the only thing to uh, point uh, out here that LP norm, this p in which we measure the norm, uh, it is strictly between one and infinity strictly between one and infinity, because you cannot do some stuff like this uh, in that extreme case is one on infinity. So that means we can apply this only in that case. So, and uh, here is a remark, uh, which is basically in the proof of this, I, I do not give you the proof of this is technically involved. Uh, you can find the, this proof, like for instance, in my book, what I just mentioned, uh, it goes back to again, 1985. Uh, and in the proof, it is clear that the only thing which we use there is that this uh, dyadic block partial sums of the Fourier series of F, that those are actually trigonometric polynomials. So we don't even need that the, those are cut from both sides. Uh, S, I mean, the, the, the frequencies are greater or equal than something and lesser equal. The only important thing is that they're lesser or equal than something. So this is the only thing which is important. So if we use this remark, then we have the same inequality, but here is just norm of this TS. So why it is important, and that was noticed by Jin Zung in, uh, in his paper in 1991 and by me in my book in 1993. Uh, so why it is important? Because uh, this theorem was proved for studying just approximation by partial sums and other properties uh, and other tools. <clears throat> And in that case, it was easy to, uh, to evaluate, to estimate the, uh, these dyadic blocks. But when we are working with uh, this operator TN, as you can see from here, this is this. So we cannot guarantee that this will be a dyadic block in that sense. We can guarantee that this will be a trigonometric polynomial of the corresponding degree. Uh, but we cannot exclude the, the small frequencies. So in that sense, this remark is important. But again, it's nothing uh, to do with this, uh, but just uh, this we uh, just make a fact, we formulate the fact that in that proof, we only use this property and we have this inequality. But as a result, this gives us uh, the following thing, the following uh, the bounds in, in general. But it's, uh, convenient uh, in case of P between, uh, not between P, uh, to consider instead of uh, the difference of uh, uh, 
like Dirichlet kernels or operators corresponding to Dirichlet kernels, the partial sums, the, the level of the level percent sums, the difference of this. And this can characterize the classes. <clears throat> and we give this characterization of, of the classes. So these are, and this is called H classes, those ones which are controlled by dyadic blocks. So this is exactly in that spirit which I just was talking about. That means we control the dyadic blocks. And so for these ones, we can prove a similar result, and that was proved in 1985, that for this class, which is known to be bigger than the corresponding W class, but still we have that same bound. But also we have this for each particular uh, delta S of this F. And then if you combine this one and that theorem which I mentioned, uh, we can get these results for all this Q and P in this range. For the function in this class, we have this bound. And in some cases, it is known that this is sharp. Maybe I will not go in this too much, uh, but just list this here, some of those results. But in this case, uh, it is known, again, from known results for Kolmogorov bits, for instance, like all these Q and P strictly, between uh, one and uh, p less or equal than two and two included then <clears throat> it is it is the right order uh, of the uh, best recovery uh, but let's not talk about this in more details just mentioning this again to stress that uh, this quantity is known for just very 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 uh, special cases like this g is equal to two and this class in infinity infinity but in case of w classes we do not know this we do not know the right order. So this is a big uh, open problem. Uh, let me uh, give you uh, one more command uh, because it's also kind of an interesting problem and not many people pay attention to that, but it might be an interesting one and might be also very, very practical. So again, now we are talking about uh, classes of functions with uh, bounded mixed derivative for difference, uh, doesn't matter. And as we already understood, uh, the uh, sets of trigonometric polynomials with frequencies like this. So this is called the hyperbolic cross. Uh, so basically that restriction there, norm S in one less or equal than N is very similar to this because uh, two to the norm S L one uh, is exactly the product of uh, the upper bounds for the frequencies. So this is very closely related. Uh, and in approximation theory, this one is called smooth hyperbolic cross and that corresponding one is uh, step hyperbolic cross, but these are detailed. So, and if you have trigonometric polynomials, then you can see that they correspond in Dirichlet kernel. Again, in this case, we do not even hope for interpolation, but just Dirichlet kernel. And the corresponding operator, the partial sum operator. So, and then it is well known it is well known that was the first result basically in the theory uh, of approximation of classes of function with bounded mixed derivative uh, that the Kolmogorov weights for this class in L2 and the Kolmogorov weights is also in L2 has this order. So this order that means this subspace, the gamma n, see this Sn is a partial sum with respect uh, to the hyperbolic cross. So the dimension of this is exactly this. So, and this is the Kolmogorov width of this class in L2. So, and it turns out that this is exactly the best thing what we can do. And this has the order n to the minus r. But now the question is, uh, and it is an open question. Uh, we don't know the best uh, order of the recovery uh, in this case, the class L2 and we are recovering in L2. Uh, but let me formulate this now in a very specific form. So what was this op operator SN? Remember this uh, was the uh, uh, convolution with the Dirichlet kernel. And in the univariate case, you know, and you remember that if you discretize this, so instead of Y and instead of integration with respect to Y, you write the corresponding sum and Ys are the zeros of the Dirichlet kernel, uh, then that operator was pretty good. That was pretty good. And the question now is, can we do this for the hyperbolic crosses? So instead of integral, uh, we discretize the convolution right in this sum. So certainly here is parameter M and you should choose this 
uh, points in a clever way. Uh, but it turns out, and this is the question, so how many points, what should be this M compared to this N, uh, which will guarantee this. So basically, instead of integration, instead of convolution, uh, we take a sum and we want to get the same relation. We don't want to lose anything, exactly that. So, and it turns out uh, that uh, this uh, is a, an interesting uh, relation, uh, but look at the following. Uh, so in, in, in one of my papers that was proved uh, that if it allow M to be N squared, extra log, but at, at this point, it not that important. If you allow N squared, remember in the univariate case, it was N. There was no squares, that was just n, but here n square, then we can do that. We can do this. And the proof was uh, like uh, uh, number theoretical because we needed to construct this point C in a very special way. But, and it is still not known if you can do that with the number m less than n square. So I think it's kind of interesting uh, problem. It's more like discretization of a, of a convolution operator. So, and I think basically I will uh, stop at this point. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much Volodya for making this beautiful topic interesting for the audience. Are there uh, comments or question? Um, maybe maybe I have one. Yes, please. Um, at some point, you uh, you said that this TN Smolniak operator behaves the same in WRP and HRP. Uh, I uh, maybe I misunderstood. I, I don't know. Uh, at some point, you you gave this bound. No, no, no. no. I did not mean that they uh, those uh, those bounds which I presented uh, they. Uh, were indeed the same order. Yes. Uh, but in general, no, 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 I, I, this, this, this may behave uh, differently. This is, this is for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So in this W class, uh, you have a better behavior for the small yak. Uh, yeah, we can, ex yeah, in some cases we do. I mean, this is your results. This is your results uh, when we get something better uh, in LP by, uh, for, for small yak um, operators, yeah, exactly. H classes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, thank you for clarifying this for, for the audience, yeah. Are there further uh, comments or questions? Yes, yes, I have a question. Mm -hmm. Please. And you mentioned an open group. An open problem. Uh, some So you mentioned some open problem several slides before. Uh, you mean you mean the one of the of the right, right order? Yes, yes. This one. Which one? For state for all p, yes, between one and infinity. Yeah. You mean this open problem? Yes. And I think that uh, when p equals two, it's known or, or what? No, no, we don't know it. Even for, for p h equals class, two? For h class, we do have it. Mm. Uh, but for w classes, we don't know that. For p equals two? Even p. for p equals two. p equals two, g equals two. No, we don't know that. Other questions? I, I have another comment. Um, in uh, this morning's talks, there was um, Katarina Pojaska talking about um, L infinity recovery, also sampling recovery. So, and this is what uh, what is 
here written on that slide 25, I think. <clears throat> because that, that bound <laughs> appeared, appeared there in, um, in Katya's talk. Mm -hmm. uh, so this one, because uh, it was interesting that in this L infinity situation, um, Smolyak's algorithm provides the optimal uh, bound here. So if you compare that to, to the, let's say, recent advances to use um, like random points or sub random points, um, we cannot beat so far um, the Smolyak rate in this um, setting. So that was an interesting connection to, to this morning's talks. And uh, yeah, it is actually this sharp bound, what is written here on that slide. Uh, yeah, which, which is uh, the best what one has in L infinity in that sense. Yeah, yeah, you mean, you mean this one, yeah. But yeah, yeah I, did not, I did not talk about this much, but I will comment on this in my second talk, uh, that uh, at this point, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, I don't know, that I would believe that the small lack uh, algorithms uh, are optimal is broken. So now we know that there are situations uh, when uh, we can get a better bound for rho, or not in this case, in this case it is the case, uh, but in some other situations, uh, the better orders of recovery are provided by other methods, not smaller. And we know for sure that smaller, because you have lower bounds for those smaller uh, recovery, uh, are worse uh, than other methods. <coughs> So, and those other methods, and uh, there will be a couple of uh, talks and uh, you'll be discussed in, in lectures, uh, this methods of uh, least squares and uh, close to that methods of approximation. So this is very interesting, I think, phenomenon. Okay, thank you for explanation. Are there further comments? It does not seem to be the case. Um, yeah, so that's the end of this afternoon session for today. Um, yeah. So we will, thank you, uh, thank yeah, you thank very you much, everybody. For, for giving the talk and thanks to all the other speakers, of course. Yeah, I think it's, we are, <laughs> we are doing pretty good stuff. Okay, yeah. Thanks a lot. Okay, so tomorrow um, we will start again at um, 10 o'clock Moscow time with a talk by, um, who is it actually? Let me see. Tomorrow we will start with Igor Kozov on sampling discretization problems in L1.